Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and coming to, to worship and to be with us this evening. We appreciate your attendance with us. If you're visiting with us, we want to make you feel welcome. We'd like to have you uh, let us get a chance to meet you as soon as service is, is over. And uh, there is a guest book located in the foyer. And if you'd like to sign that, we'd love for you to, so we'd have a record of your attendance here. Uh, remember those that are in the bulletin who have asked for prayer. It's important that we, we lift those people up this week to God in prayer. Uh, financial statements and notes from the business meeting is on the table in the back, and that business meeting occurred Saturday morning, so you can get those business meeting notes if you like. Uh, just take a copy off of the table. Uh, Mike, what's the deal on pictures tonight? Are we done? Okay. Anybody needs a picture, you can see Mike even tonight. Thank you, Mike. Sign up sheets for people who are willing to teach nursery or lead prayers or uh, do other chores and tasks here in this congregation. We would love for you to take one of those sheets. Well, I think there's an individual sheet for each job, isn't there? individual sheet for each job so you'll need to look through there and find your your preferences and please sign up for helping out and doing and working at the congregation here those sign up sheets are also on the back table we sure like to welcome mark and jody bryant would you stand they play, there are new members here. We thank you so very much for being here, and we pray that God will be glorified by you, and we sure that we are sure that you will glorify him by being here. So we're thrilled to have you worshiping with us. Brother Chad. I might have thrown my back out a little bit with that, no. All right, we're going to start out with Give Me the Bible tonight. If, you're in your, if you need a song book, it's 450 is what it is. Give Me the Bible. We're going to do all three verses.
Next song, 615. He keeps me singing. He keeps me singing. <clears throat> There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In a love like seven flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing. Keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on sheltering wings, always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweet singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall rest with him on Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we do come to you thankful for being able to be out again tonight to worship you and to call attention, Father, to your great name and your power and your glory and your mercy and your grace toward us. We're thankful for that grace, Father, for without it we wouldn't have hope for eternity, but with it we have all hope now and later. Father, we had a great Lord's Day morning already. Good things were done and said. Thankful for the members that meet at this place, the effort that they put out, all the good things they do that sometimes go unnoticed. Just grateful to be here, Father, and to serve you. We pray for all the congregations across the world that have served you this day, have taken communion with thee and drawn close to thee, maybe reevaluated their lives, Father, hopefully before they took that communion so they could draw close to you in a good way. Father, locally, just, lo just heard that uh, our brothers met over at 5th and Greenwich in the Spanish ministry and that they had 65 members present. Also was told that the enthusiasm was just bubbling over over there and the appreciation was there. We're thankful, so thankful for this effort. Thankful for Westside that uh, helped out with that immensely and made that happen. We, we hope and pray, Father, that that's a great mission and that they can fill that building up soon. We ask now that you'd be with us as we continue this service. Help us listen attentively to the sermon. Help us to sing praises to your name. Help us to get a real enthusiasm for the week that waits and help us go out and sow the seed of the kingdom starting tonight and tomorrow as we go in our workforce. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If you, if you are using a songbook, the song after the lesson is going to be 904, Have You Been to Jesus? 904. 
The song before Luke's message is going to be Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, 648. If you would, Stand Up for Jesus. We sing the first and last verse of this song. <clears throat> stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Well, good evening. Wonderful to see Mark and Jody place membership. I was running around out in the middle of nowhere a couple of days ago. Well, Jim Killer will know where this is because it was right across the street from Johnny's place. Some of you know where that is. The great metropolitan area of Pleasant Grove or Bullfrog Valley, whatever you want to call it. And I was looking at putting up a deer stand over there, and I was walking down the road, and a UPS truck came cruising by, and then it started slowing down, then it turned around, and then it started coming back towards me, and then it started, and I was like, started a little, what, and I thought, well, Johnny must have got a package, and then Mark opened door and said, you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really, but, you know, that's another story. We're glad to have you. I'm glad to have everybody here this evening. Sometimes, like this morning, for better or worse, that sermon was one of those that just came to me because, well, you just read a passage and something sticks out to you. And here's another one tonight uh, that kind of just built into what it is based on a passage that just kind of caught my eye. This is a conversation in Luke 12. There's actually a couple of conversations here. There's one between a really selfish young man. And there's another conversation that's between a gentleman who thought he had everything in the world and God. And at the end of that conversation, in Luke 12 and 20, it says, But God said to him, You fool. Remember this morning? Paul said, Don't live as a fool in Ephesians 5 and 15, but live as someone who is wise. God looks at this man and he says, you've lived as a fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? I don't hardly watch any television anymore, but back in 2012 there was a series on the History Channel. And some of you may have seen this, but it's called The Men Who Built America. Did anybody see this? If you haven't, I see one hand. It's a fantastic series, and I would encourage you to, uh, to watch it. But it's built primarily around five individuals, and they are really responsible for what we would call the, the infrastructure of the modern United States. Or Cornelius Vanderbilt, born 1794, died 1877. He basically rewrote the geography of the United States uh, through railroads and through shipping and inland water trade. When he died at 82, he was the wealthiest man that the United States had ever seen. 
And then there's one that everybody's heard, or at least the last name most people have heard, and that would be John D. Rockefeller. Born 1838 through 19, he lived through 1937. He was the founder of Standard Oil. He gave the country cheap kerosene and introduced the world to this strange substance we're going to call gasoline. You know anything about that? Anybody bought any lately? Or could you afford to buy any lately? As a single individual, this may not sound like a lot, but he was 2% of the U.S. economy. One person. John D. Rockefeller could make a decision financially or in business, and it would affect every single American on a daily basis. He had that kind of power. He could influence the direction of the whole country. And then there was a gentleman by the name of Andrew Carnegie. I've heard his last name said Carnegie. I don't know. You guys decide. He was born 1835. He died in 1919. And he was all about steel. He built, essentially, the U.S. steel industry. And he led its expansion. And any major city that you go into, there is Carnegie Steel there. And then we can think about John Pierpont Morgan. Born 1837, died 1913. He controlled the flow of money, essentially, in the United States. He owned Wall Street. And his financial decisions, his personal decisions, think about the power just for a moment. If, if you made a financial decision and it affected people in India, and it affected people in South America and Canada, that is, and all over the world, he owned Wall Street. And then there was Henry Ford. If you don't know who any of these other people are, I mean, you know who started the greatest car company in the world. They're in the process of wrecking it right now. Uh, but it was at one time. In the 1930s, Detroit was the richest city uh, in the world, uh, largely thanks to Henry Ford and some others. He was born 1863, died 1947. He brought manufacturing to a place that no one thought possible. And there's a real argument uh, that he's one of the individuals who is responsible for us winning the Second World War uh, with his assembly line production, which he invented. Even in the 1930s, he brought untold wealth into his life and to those around him as the Great Depression descended. Think about those men for just a moment. You couldn't get any richer. In today's money, they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And hold on to that for just a second. In 1 Chronicles 29 and 11, the writer of Chronicles says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, indeed everything that is in the heavens and the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. And your rule over all, and in your hands, is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. For these money, or for these men, their money, their power, or at least their perception of it, was their legacy. And yet, where are they now? And where is that fortune and where is all that they built? God asked this man, this barn builder, who will own what you have prepared? You know what happened to all these folks? The kids have squabbled over it through the generations. Uh, the money has, in many cases, been sw uh, squandered. Uh, Standard Oil was broken up as a monopoly, and all the names that you know today, Chevron and Exxon and uh, on and on. And as we look at our own lives, we need to realize that we have a stewardship. We may never have, we'll never have, that's for certain, uh, the kind of power and, and money that individuals like this had in this world. But God has given me a life. And I wonder if people like this or if these men ever stopped and said, you know, God has given me this. I'm going to let him have my life. 
for the most part, their empires were about them. They were about who could get the most and who could build the most. Although I will say that Carnegie and Rockefeller in the end decided to see who could give away the most. But even that was about them. Because we, they wanted their names on all the buildings to this day uh, that still bear those names. In Luke 12... There's a fellow that, at least in spirit, is much like this. He comes to Jesus as Jesus is teaching. Well, Jesus is almost always teaching. And Jesus had been saying things like, you need to confess me before the world. You need to not worry about who can destroy the the body, but he who can destroy the body uh, in soul, in hell. As he often did. And a guy just barges in it would seem it doesn't even appear that Jesus knew who this man was maybe he had had some dealings with him on a previous occasion but this gentleman runs up to Jesus and in Luke 12 and 13 he says teacher tell the my brother to divide the family inheritance with me and I'm particularly sensitive to this and those of you that have taught are as well you got a lesson plan and you know what you want to do, and then somebody just blurts something out to just completely derail what you're trying to do, and you can get pretty upset by it. But Jesus shows himself to be a master teacher here, and instead of getting upset about it, uh, he takes this opportunity uh, to really do some different teaching, some that perhaps needed to be done instead of that which he uh, intended to do. Here's a man who could think about nothing but himself. He could think about nothing but his own wealth and his own power. He was truly the center of his own universe and everyone just orbited around him. When I think about the church, one of the worst things that can ever happen to us is for us to start thinking about what we want and what we need instead of thinking about that which is happening and what is occurring in the lives of those around us. You know, Jesus came to earth because there were a lot of things happening in your life and in my life and in the lives of every human being so that we could be close to God. It was all about you. He didn't have any reason to come otherwise. I mean, why? You think about Philippians 2 and all those wonderful things that Paul says there are all those amazing things where he gave up all of the prerogatives of deity and and the wonderment of heaven so Jesus here decides instead of dismissing this fellow although he does to some degree dismiss him he decides to respond and probably not in the way that he expected he looks at him and there's disdain in this the the original language will kind of bear this out Sometimes righteous anger is uh, entirely appropriate, and Jesus shows some of that. He says, man, who appointed me judge over you? In other words, what business of this is mine? You go and take care of your business. I'm not getting in your family business. I don't know if you guys have a policy about that or not, but I try to stay out of family business. And Jesus didn't want anything uh, to do with it. So he said, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And then he said to them, and this is where he shifts gears a bit, He says, beware, all right, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has abundance does his life consist of his possessions. That is diametrically opposed to what your culture has taught you your entire life. The culture that we live in, somebody might take a certain objection to this, but the only way I know to say it is, is that there is a satanic idea that is constantly in our face, and that is that my life does consist of my possessions. So I need to be like an Andrew Carnegie, or I need to be like a John D. Rockefeller. I need to aspire to that. And yet there is this futility in it because, as God says to this, or the gentleman in the parable that follows this, When you go, who will get all that you have acquired? There was a purpose in Jesus' questions 
He wanted this man to know that God is not some divine referee. You know, God's not in the heavens for me to say, okay, Lord, I need you to do this and I need you to do that. He's not running around up there pushing buttons and fixing all of my problems. Jesus wanted him to focus on the root cause. This man didn't think there was anything wrong with him. But all he thought about from the moment he got up till the time he went to bed is, what is mine? Give it to me. And let me have it. He never stopped and thought about, what could I do with what I have for other people? And that's fundamentally Christianity. If you want practical Christianity just on a, a, a really basic level, the question is, what can you do for the person next to you? That's the way Jesus always looked at everybody. What do you need? Every day I think we ought to do something for somebody else. At least one thing for other people. Now I know there's days when uh, we need to, somebody says, I'm going to take a day for me. And that makes sense. But as a rule, we need to constantly think about what we can do for those around us. So Jesus wisely says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Greed can take all kinds of forms. Usually we think about money, but some people are greedy for attention. They're constantly desiring that other people would listen to them. Uh, They're greedy for influence. They're greedy for a particular position. I've seen this in the church. Somebody wants to be on a committee and they really want to be on it and they want to head it up and they're going to they're going to build it or uh, they're going to make sure that it, that, that it happens and well if I run over somebody in the process and getting things done the way I want them see that's the greed there uh, then I'm not really concerned about that and that's to be blind to something that's really deadly uh, to relationships and to the church one can even be really greedy for spiritual things I can think of Simon He was a new Christian in Acts chapter 8, and he came into contact with Peter. And it says that when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed on someone by the laying on of the apostles' hands, do you know what he did? He said, here's some money. Let me buy that ability. You know, I'm going to cash in on this. Probably he thought, if I buy this, well, then I can turn around and sell it. You see? Don't ever try to buy God off. And don't ever try to buy yourself into his good graces. Jesus declared it's diametrically opposed, the position that we hold to what the world says. Life does not consist in the abundance of what one possesses. Life consists in the abundance of what we choose to do for God. And where our mind is really set. I pay a lot of attention to Elon Musk. Anybody else? I find this guy somewhat fascinating. He genuinely believes that it is a legitimate thing and a good idea to live on Mars. I don't know if you've ever studied studied Mars, but you couldn't build a more hostile environment to human life. It takes six months to travel there, and he's already said, in order to do this, we're going to have to kill a lot of people to get all of this set up. He's looking to the heavens. In his mind, he's looking to the things above. And then there's another fellow, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, He runs a a jungle website. Uh, His name is Jeff Bezos, and he wants to do the same thing. He wants to take us into space, and we're going to build all of these colonies, and we're going to live in all of these pods, sort of like the Jetsons it really come uh, to life. Maybe that'll be kind of cool. You know, there, we were told 50 or 60 years ago we'd already be there, and we're not even a step closer uh, than we were. I think I'll stay on earth regardless of what happens. Here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. This doesn't do it justice, but think about this for just a moment. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Now, can you think, even get your head around that? Usually when you start talking about stuff like this, I lose everybody because how do you think about something traveling 186,000 miles in a second? But if you traveled at that speed, 
It would take 100,000 years at that speed, 100,000 years to go across this little thing we call the Milky Way galaxy. And that's how little we are right there in what is an incomprehensibly vast galaxy. And by the way, there's thousands and perhaps even millions of these we don't, we don't even know. And for men like this, the idea that we can just basically go, if you were to measure from where we are to where Mars is in regard to the, the universe, you, you wouldn't even hardly be able to see the line that was drawn to it. They would be so close. And this is their idea of setting your mind on the things above. And yet it's really not, is it? It's still in the physical. It's still uh, in this universe. Paul said in Colossians 3 and 1, this is what we really need to do. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Not the things above me in the solar system, but the things beyond the solar system. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things not above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is in, hidden in Christ. 1 John 2 and 15, do not love the things of the world. If anyone loves the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus really wanted to drive this home, so he he ends this section with what I'm just going to call a sobering reality. It's really where we, we started It's an illustration of the wisdom of Jesus, and it's a parable that has become quite famous. So Jesus said to them, he told them a parable. The land of a rich man was very productive, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? He could have said, he could have said, there's a lot of poor people in the world, in the world that he lived in. There were, there were no welfare states. There were no safety nets for people when they got older. There were the rich, there, and there were the poor. There were the haves and the have-nots. And so he could have said, man, I'm going to set up some tables, and I'm just going to welcome the community in, and I'm going to let them have whatever they want. I've got such an abundance. But then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns. He had perfectly good barns. Nothing wrong with them, but I'm going to tear them down. And the reason I'm going to do that is so I can build a bigger one and then I will store all of my grain. Notice those pronouns? I'm going to do it. I'm going to build my barn and then I'm going to take my grain and I'm going to take my goods and I'm going to put them in that barn. And then I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. So this guy's just, man, I mean, he's got decades in front of him. The future's bright. You know, he's building, he's blowing, he's going. Everything's great. So what does he say? Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Time to celebrate. I've got mine. I mean, I'm not concerned about yours. I've got everything that I want. And then there's that moment where God speaks to him and ultimately that moment when God will speak to all of us but God said to him you fool now by the standards of the culture that we live in he was a wise man but God says you fool this very night your soul is required of you and now who will own what you have prepared it really doesn't matter who who's going to own it right The point is, is he will never own it again. Andrew Carnegie can build all the skyscrapers that he wants. He will never see them or have any of them again. John D. Rockefeller uh, can build all the concert halls he wants. And all the colleges, he will never have anything to do with them again. J.P. Morgan can amass all the money uh, imaginable. And he'll never, ever have anything to do with it again. Elon Musk can actually go to Mars and he can build that colony. But someday, he'll never have anything to do with it again. And so what is Jesus wanting 
uh, in all of this? Well, there's several things that he wants us to note. There's several points in this parable. Let's look at them briefly. Beware of success, number one. You know, failure and hard times drive more people to God than success ever has. Success almost invariably, if it gets great enough, Causes people to look away from him. The man in this parable saw only himself. He forgot that he was a steward. That what he had was actually God's. That everything that he had. That the barns were God's. That the grain was God's. That the the crops were God's. The fields were God's. The skies, the rain, the house that he lived in. It's all God's, folks. Maybe I just, that's what I wanted to say tonight. I'm not really sure. But I think maybe that is. Let's make sure we use it for him. Beware of success. What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Beware of self-assurance. He says, this is what I will do. See, this fellow has got a plan. You got a plan? I hope it extends to the things above and that it's not just grounded on the earth. He had a real eye trouble, didn't he? Some 13 times he says, I, me, or mine in all of this. And rather than being humbled by God's providence and what he had, he was haughty and self-serving. Beware of self-security, Jesus would say. People think, well, if I can just get enough, then I'm going to be secure. I've been around people who, who really did think this and people in the church. And what I found that was really sad was what they really became was really worried about everything that they had. The more that they had, the more they had to concern themselves with, the more they had to put stuff places, the more meetings they had to have with the bankers about what they had, the more insurance they had to buy, and then it just exploded out of control. So what did Jesus say about all this? Do not store your treasures up on earth where rust destroys and where moss destroys and where thieves break in and steal, but put them in heaven where there are no moths. That's, I'm just tickled to death to find this out. There are no moths in heaven. And there's no rust. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else you say about heaven, but we know that much. And there's no thieves. There's nothing I hate more than somebody stealing something from me. I don't know how you feel about that. I suspect you're the same way, but get up in the... Get up in the morning and find out somebody's come up in the yard and stole one of the kids' bicycles or something like that. I, I know why God put in the, in, the, in the old law. He said, you know, if the sun has risen, you, you don't get to chase them down. Because, I, boy, I'd sure like to. There are no thieves in heaven. And then he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, if I am making those regular deposits in the bank account of heaven then what do I know about me? I know that's where my heart is. See, someone like Elon Musk, his heart's on Mars. Jeff Bezos, it's out there somewhere and, you know, with the blue origin and where, it, where it's going. Are those magnates that, that built all of those incredible buildings in the steel industry and all of that, where was their heart? It was here, see. It was on the earth. And finally, Jesus said, beware of self-satisfaction. Don't be self focus do you and I well we may not have a lot in comparison to many but I'm answerable for what I do have because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it so what Jesus wanted this man who wanted everything from his brother you tell my brother to give me what's mine and what God wanted of this man uh, who decided to invest in all things on earth is that they would invest in the things eternal and that they would be rich towards God. And so may we be a people that put God above the gold of this world, that put people above pleasures, and put eternity above ease. If we can help you tonight in any way, if you need to put on the Lord in baptism, or if you need the help of this congregation, please come as we stand and sing.
Lord's Supper has been left prepared in room one if you were not able to partake of it this morning. Um, during the song, if you'll, you can dismiss back there and there'll be some guys in the back um, waiting to give that, to, waiting for you back there. Uh, tonight, we for those, we do have a, I failed to mention this morning, we got a sixth grade and under Devo tonight at the building. And then we've got a senior high and junior high and senior high Devo at Dan Dolores' house. And um, are there any other announcements we have before we go? All right. Abide with me. I think we learned this morning in class the last one of the last songs on the Titanic, right? I probably shouldn't have said that, should I? I'm, never mind. Abide with me. First and last verses. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the beautiful day that you've given us and for our ability to meet here this morning and again this evening to worship you, to hear another portion of your word, Father. And, and, and Father, we thank you so much for the work that Luke is, it puts into these lessons and, and how that we can look at the things that, uh, that he's teaching us and see where that those things apply to our the lives that we live and the ways that we can make our lives better and live closer to you. Father, we pray for those of our number that aren't with us this evening for whatever reason, and if we can be a, a, a help to, to them for, for, from any standpoint, Father, help us to recognize those opportunities to reach out and to be that shoulder if, we, if uh, someone needs it. But for whatever reason, Father, that they're not here, we pray for them. And if they're ill, Father, we know that there are some of our number that are, are suffering, that uh, are having health issues or for whatever their, uh, their needs are, Lord. We know that you know them, and, and we pray that you put your healing hand to them. And, Father, as we go forth out of here today and then and into this next coming week, we pray that uh, we'll seek the opportunities that you, you put in front of us that, uh, and we'll recognize the opportunities for what they are, that we can talk to our friends, talk to our neighbors, talk to people that we meet uh, about you, because many, we all know people that we, we, we know that are lost, and, and Father, help us to have the courage and the commitment to, to speak to them, to talk to them, and to do what we can to help them see uh, what's missing in their lives. And Father, we pray as we go through this next week that that uh, you'll see us safety through it and that we'll uh, be able to be back here at the next time, this coming Wednesday and, of course, the following Lord's Day. But, Lord, help us to, to not worry so much about uh, just being ready for that day, but be ready for every day. Father, as we go through our lives, we know, that we, we know for certain that we don't know so much and that we know that we, uh, these, these lives are going to come to an end and uh, we, Father, we want to be prepared, not, 
not just uh, on Sunday or not just on Wednesday night, but for every day of our lives and, and help us to continually work to, for that preparation. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us and help us to never lose sight of where all these good and perfect things that we enjoy so much in this world come from. We thank you for the blessings that you give us each day and, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and we do appreciate, uh, but Father, we very often forget to thank, uh, thank the, the real uh, creator of, of the things that we, that we enjoy so much, the things that make our lives easier and the things that we uh, very often uh, don't appreciate. Lord, walk with us. In the end, uh, we ask that you give us a home with you. Father, we know that there are times that we'll sin and, uh, and that we may not recognize it at the time, Father, but help us to recognize those, uh, those mistakes and we ask your forgiveness as we repent. These things you're praying, Jesus.